Occupational English Test Listening Test This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract. And you'll hear the extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions 1 to 24, complete the notes with the information you hear. Now, look at the notes for Extract 1. Extract 1, questions 1 to 12. You'll hear a podiatrist talking to a patient called Julia Smith. For questions 1 to 12, Complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Ms. Smith. It's a pleasure to see you today. The referral letter from your GP is quite detailed, but could you tell me, in your own words, what you're hoping we can achieve today? Oh, call me Julia, and... Where do I start? Well, first of all, thanks for seeing me this late. I guess you're used to us 43-year-olds trying to have it all, keeping pretty odd hours, huh? Yes, I am. Sometimes it seems like the corporate world never sleeps. True. Well, as you know, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes not too long ago, and I'm really just trying to get my head around it all. I really should have known, because I was always at risk of getting it, and with my hectic lifestyle and love of foods with junk in the title, it really was only a matter of time. Now, the way the doctor tells it, I have to take this medication daily for the foreseeable future at least. I guess the reason I'm here is because of late I've noticed some discoloration in my feet, particularly the right one. In fact, if you look, it's all kind of becoming quite red and splotchy. It wasn't like that before. Yes, I can see. Would you mind if I take a closer look? No, not at all. I'll be pressing different areas of your foot, and I'm going to ask you what you feel and where. I'm going to need you to close your eyes for me while I do this. No peeking, okay? Okay. Thanks. Tell me, Julia, when I press here, where do you feel that? I can't feel anything. No tingling, no pressure, nothing. It's like it's just numb, you know? I didn't realise that before. Oh goodness, is it going to get worse? Not necessarily. What about here, Julia? Oh yes, I can definitely feel that towards the heel. It's a little tickly. Okay, and here? Yes, I can feel that too. In this sort of region. Okay. So it seems that there's just this area to worry about near the lateral planter. I noticed that you came in with a slight limp. Are you in any pain at all? Not particularly. I just don't want to make it worse. After I noticed, I really just wanted to stay at home until this consultation, but I had to go to work. I'm a digital marketing executive, and our client base can be pretty demanding, so I've been at work since the accident. I'm just trying to get back to my regular routine. Although I do draw the line at going back to judo or netball with the girls. At least until I'm fully better. That makes sense. Any idea what it is? Yes. Have you ever heard of small vessel disease? No, I'm not familiar with that. Although, I guess it's when the blood network in the feet shrinks? Almost. It's what we call the situation where there's a lack of blood flow from the heart to the foot. When the tiny arteries in the foot are blocked. 
It's not necessarily the reason for the discoloration, though, so I'd need to re-refer you back to your GP to take a look at that. Oh, right. You don't have any lesions on your foot, which is a good sign. But with neuropathy, we really do have to act quickly to make sure that it doesn't develop any further. Is that like gangrene? I've heard that people can have gangrene and have to have their feet lopped off. Neuropathy is the stage before that, and like I said, it looks like you're here just in time. I'd like to give you some advice so that you know how to look after your feet in between our annual checkups here at the clinic. Thank you. I'd be very grateful for that. When you're walking about in the house, are you usually barefoot? No. It can get quite chilly, so I do always try to wear something, even if it's just my fluffy pink slippers. That's good. Try to check the soles of your feet every day. Look out for any changes to the color, temperature. Particularly look out for any swelling and contact the clinic or myself if you notice any lesions, okay? Definitely. Great. It's unlikely that the sensations in your feet will return, but please do make a note of any other unusual sensations that you feel in other areas of your foot. If, for example, you notice the numbness spreading, then definitely give us a call. Extract 2. Questions 13 to 24. You hear a GP talking to a patient, John Clark. For questions 13 to 24, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mr. Clark. It's a pleasure to see you today. The receptionist notes are quite detailed, but could you tell me, in your own words, what you're hoping we can achieve today? Of course I can, Doctor, but I bet you won't believe me when I do. Never heard of anyone getting so sick after a quick bite down the pub. Since that night, I've had this really sour taste in my mouth that I can't get rid of, no matter how hard I try. Really? Is there anything else I should be aware of? Sure, as if that weren't bad enough, I keep getting this cough over and over again. Can't shake it no matter what I try. Been swirling fish oil for the last few days and now it's working. I say swirling because nothing's going down my throat. I can't swallow anything and it's getting on my nerves. How long has this been happening? Which bit of it? All of it. Er, uh, I would say the last few. Actually, you know what? It's more than that. Five, maybe six. You know what, let's just say several weeks. I've lost count, to be honest with you. But it's certainly been a good chunk of time. OK. Do you have any idea what prompted it? Not really. All I remember was being out for a meal with a few mates three or so weeks ago down the pub, like I say. There was absolutely nothing unusual about that night. I ordered my vindaloo, as I always do... I like a bit of spicy curry, you see. And ever since, I've been feeling rotten. Immediately after dinner, I had the runs and a burning pain in my lower chest region. No idea why. I usually have a clean bill of health. Never had nothing like this before. Take away my fags that I smoke every so often, and I'm a picture of perfect health. What about your drinking habits? Do you drink at all? Doesn't everybody... I'm not saying I'm an alky or anything, but I do like a couple of spirits with the lads now and again. I see. From what you've told me, Mr. Clark, I'd say that you experienced pyrosis, or at the very least, some kind of stomach upset. But I would like to run some tests to be sure that we're giving you the best possible remedies. All right. Is there anything I can do in the meantime? You can watch your diet for me. I mean, I know you like a bit of spice here and there, but this can be achieved while eating well. OK, a balanced diet is easier said than done. Have you got any tips to help me stick to that? 
Right now I'm on the seafood diet. When I'm out and about, I see food and I eat it. Why not have a journal of everything you eat? What, keep like a food diary? I guess I can, but how's that going to stop me from grazing at night? It's all about routine. For example, if you wake up, go to work, come back and get ready for bed on autopilot, it's helpful to get into the habit of preparing your next day's meal before you go to bed. On that point, it's crucial that you... Go to sleep at the same time every day. I know, I remember. You gave me the same advice last time. You remember? That's good news. Let's see what we can do for you in terms of those diagnostics. That is the end of part A. Part B. In this part of the test, there are six short extracts relating to the work of health professionals. For questions 25 to 30, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to what you hear. Question 25. You hear part of a training session for dental students. Now read the question. It seems that halitosis, or bad breath, is pretty common these days, and we've got to find a way to address patients' needs in the most tactful way possible. You seem puzzled. No, I understand what we've covered. I'm just wondering, wouldn't the hygienist usually cover this? Not necessarily. Good oral hygiene is something that we need to encourage at every opportunity. Patients need to be familiar with optimum brushing techniques, as well as the proper way to reach each tooth whilst brushing or flossing. This is something you'll need to build into your consultations as standard. Okay, thank you. I'll let you know if I have any other questions. All right. Now that we've got that covered, next week we'll discuss prescribing painkillers to patients. Can't wait. Question 26. You hear a GP and his receptionist conversing about a patient. Now read the question. Mrs. David called again and she's really keen to see if you could fit her in today. I had a look at the list this morning, and unless I'm mistaken, it looks like we're pretty blocked up today. Actually, Mr. Lopez called in to switch from today to Monday. The cancellation means that Mrs. David could potentially come in today at 4 p.m. Hmm. You know, the last thing I need is to start making last-minute changes, only to find out that Mrs. David just has another migraine or something. We've got some pretty nasty viruses going around. She did say it was pretty urgent, and she sounds in a bad way. I took notes of the conversation. Hmm. Well, with the symptoms she's describing, it sounds like she's got a bout of meningitis, but I can't confirm that until she's here. 4 p.m., you say? No problem. Thank you, Dr. Stein. I'll phone her now. Question 27. You here? A staff meeting between junior doctors and their seniors. Now read the question. OK, so today we've got quite a bit of work to get through I need you to stay close and really pay attention to what you're seeing. Being able to deal with young service users is an art, and if you're good, and I mean really good, you have the potential to really brighten these children's and in turn their parents' lives. We'll do a quick round and see the patients. A lot of them will have just had surgery, so we'll need to cheer them up a little. 
A smile can go a long way in that regard, but sometimes they'll just need an ear or a shoulder from you. Don't worry, you'll get used to playing the proverbial big brother. Oh, you look like a deer in the headlights right now. Am I going too fast? Just stop and ask if you have any questions, okay? Question 28. You hear a conversation between two nurses. Now read the question. Glad you could make it, Lucy. How are you getting on? All right, I guess. This is a quick forum to find out how yourself and your colleagues are getting on, so there's no need to hold back. What's on your mind? Really, I'm fine. This is my second week on my rotation, and so whilst I'm a little unsure with patients right now, I know that feeling will pass after a few months. I also feel really supported by my female mentors and colleagues, but one major issue that I think needs addressing is the doctor-to-patient ratio. Some of my colleagues have some really awful stories, and I myself think that a 15-hour shift is excessive. Don't get me wrong, I do really love it here, I just wish that would be addressed. Oh, and for a new vending machine in the mess, the one there now is kind of rusty. Question 29. You hear doctors discussing an emergency. Now read the question. Would you help me, please? I've just been bleeped and there's a patient crashing in Ward 7. Sure. I know a shortcut to 7. Come this way. Any idea what's going on? Heart rate is 110 BPM. BP is 210 over 90. His respiratory rate is high, but his temperature is normal. Okay. Were you given anything else? Not really. I remember that I've seen the patient before, and the most I know is that he was admitted with a renal problem associated with acute dehydration. Right now, I don't know what's going on. Just that it's an emergency. We've really got to be quick. Right behind you. I'll do my best to help. It sounds like he'll need hemodialysis urgently. Question 30. You hear a doctor breaking bad news. Now read the question. You had us a little worried there. I had myself a little worried there, too. You know what? Not a lot of people can take a tumble like that one day and have a smile that bright the next. I'm very proud of you, Mrs. Fernando. Thank you. All right, like I explained to you, you've picked up a little hematoma from your trip, so I'd like to prescribe some ibuprofen for you. You can pick it up over the counter. Along with paracetamol, in case I run dry. No, there's no need. There's enough here. Make sure you get plenty of rest, okay? Okay, Doctor. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear a healthcare practitioner talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, choose answer A, B or C, which you think best fits according to what you hear. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with optometrist Tanya Dean discussing loss of vision. You now have 90 seconds 
to read questions 31 to 36. Good evening all. My name is Tanya Dean and I'm an optometrist. Today I'd like to talk to you about loss of vision or blindness or visual impairment. It is described as loss of the ability to see anything, including light. One can be completely blind or have a partial visual impairment. Cases of blindness are on the rise worldwide and these are attributed to several factors and causes such as age and disease among others. Globally, almost 1.3 billion people are living with eye problems and some form of visual loss. Those with distance vision account for 188.5 million people regarded to have mild vision impairment, while 217 million people account for moderate to severe forms. Sadly, 36 million people are blind. A population of 826 million people have near vision problems worldwide. In the United Kingdom, approximately 2 million people have problems with their vision, while 360,000 are registered as completely blind. The number of blind people is still on the rise, and it is approximated that soon, more than 2 million people will be diagnosed with some form of blindness. Causes of blindness vary, but susceptibility to loss of vision can be heightened by various risk factors. These include age, certain health conditions like diabetes, and freak accidents. It is worth noting here that people of a lower socioeconomic status are also more at risk of loss of vision. In the UK, the leading risk factor for loss of vision is advanced age. Life expectancy in Britain is high, and the rates at which age-related macular degeneration blindness is increasing is alarming. According to the statistics on vision loss, one in every five people who are 75 years old and above have been diagnosed and are living with blindness. In people who are 90 years old and above, the risk increases to one in every two people. Other risk factors include gender and people living with learning disabilities. Women are more susceptible to experiencing forms of sight loss than men, while people who have learning disabilities are at a greater risk than ordinary people. Other causes of blindness in the United Kingdom are poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, glaucoma, and cataracts, among others. Blindness can be classified into many groups, but majorly as partial and complete loss of vision. According to the World Health Organization, it can also be classified as near vision blindness and distance vision blindness. In partial blindness, an individual can see things to some extent, while in complete blindness, the patient is unable to see anything, even bright light. In the United Kingdom, blindness is classified according to severity, and they are three classes as follows. Severely sight impairment, sight impairment, and low vision. In severe sight impairment, the affected individual is unable to see objects at 3 metres, as compared to a normal person who can see things up to 60 metres. Their central visual acuity is less than 3 out of 60 with normal visual fields. 
Those who are sight impaired can see at three meters something that a commonly sighted person can spot at 60 meters. Still, it is considered less severe, and in most cases, such people are not usually included in the National Blindness Registry. In the low vision, the individual has visual acuity lower than 6 eighteenths and is not allowed to drive. This is due to the problems they have recognising faces and other details that are across the road. Other forms of blindness include colour blindness and legal blindness. In colour blindness, an individual is unable to distinguish colours, whereas in legal blindness, a person is only able to see within 20 metres instead of the required 200 metres for an average person. Signs and symptoms of blindness include poor night vision, feeling of eye cloudiness, plus an inability to see shapes or shadows. For infants, they may present with eye redness, constant rubbing and hypersensitivity to light, white pupils, continuous production of tears, and abnormal alignment of eye or movements after six months of age. Diagnosis is made through comprehensive history taking, physical examination, and use of Snellen's chart, among others. Most of the causes of eye problems like cataracts and refractive errors are preventable. Hygiene is also an important aspect of preventing blindness. Treatment options include correcting the refractive errors, treating any bacterial infections, and surgical corrections. Use of contact lenses and corrective glasses can also help people with low visual acuity or sight impairment. Extract 2 Questions 37 to 42. You hear Dr. Mariah Whitney discussing arthritis. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Welcome to the Health Matters Podcast. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Mariah Whitney, who's going to talk to us about arthritis. Now, a lot of our listeners are familiar with arthritis, but I know I'd appreciate a recap, especially because most of the news stories out there say that, even though it's becoming more common, people aren't seeking the help that they need. Why is that? Thank you for having me and Ricky, and yes, I'd be delighted to clear up any misconceptions. First of all, arthritis is an inflammatory disease of the joints that occurs mostly on knee joints or joints on the fingers, among others. The inflammation is often accompanied by pain and irritation in the joints. As you mentioned, most people don't realize they have it and instead describe their situations that they just started feeling pain and hotness in their bones. At first, They assumed that taking some over-the-counter drugs to relieve pain would suffice, but they find that with time, their problems progress to the point that they can't walk without help, or sometimes even at all. It is usually at that point that they decide to call for help and make an appointment to see a specialist like myself. Okay, you know when most people think of arthritis, they think of osteoarthritis, but there are many forms and it affects every aspect of sufferers' everyday lives, doesn't it? That's true. 
In fact, arthritis has affected many people all over the world and in all aspects of life. According to BBC News, it was reported that according to a recent survey, within the UK, many people with arthritis reported losing their jobs due to complications from the disease. The majority reported missing days of work due to the pain they were experiencing, as well as other symptoms. Just to put it in context, more than 600,000 people with arthritis miss going to work annually in Britain. However, the total number of people diagnosed with arthritis each year is over 10 million. As high as the number is, it is anticipated to rise in the future. Still, there seems to be some trepidation about involving employers or HR in the management of workers' condition. One of the main reasons that some may choose not to disclose their condition is due to embarrassment that they are suffering from an illness that typically affects older workers. Another reason for the discrepancy could be due to fear. Employees having heard stories from colleagues who have lost their jobs because of the disease. Gosh, I'd like to think that employers would be supportive of their employees, but I guess that's not the case with all workplaces. What about treatment, Dr. Whitney? What kind of treatment is available and Are the available options somewhat influenced by the most common types of arthritis? I suppose the treatment depends on the type of arthritis we're dealing with. You see, arthritis can be caused by several factors. No synovial fluid is delivered. This means that there are more than 100 types of the condition that affects people worldwide. Some examples are gout, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus, erythematosus, scleroderma, hypermobility syndrome, juvenile dermatomyositis, and fibromyalgia, among others. Even though the list is pretty long, the most common types of arthritis are osteoarthritis, as you said, and also rheumatoid arthritis. Having any arthritis is detrimental to someone's life. It does not depend on how common the disease is. The causes range from wear and tear at the joints, especially the knee, shoulder, and hip joint, to autoimmune destruction of the components of the joints, among others. In addition to pain in the joints, the typical arthritic patient also experiences inflammation in the joint characterized by redness and increased temperature. The decrease in range of motion and stiffness is also evident in such patients and acts as an alarm bell. During diagnosis, the signs and symptoms are basic, and all the healthcare professionals are expected to know the distinctive traits of each type of arthritis if they are doing their jobs properly. This will assist doctors during diagnosis, especially in the terms of choosing the further testing, such as blood tests, to check for rheumatoid factors, x-rays, MRIs, and computed tomography to help the healthcare provider to rule other causes of joint swelling and pain. I see. Dr. Whitney, would you break down some of the types of the condition that we come across most frequently? I think our listeners would be particularly interested in how they are managed. Sure. Take, for example, rheumatoid arthritis. This involves joints of the fingers and the hands and occurs due to body's immunity self-destruction which ends up destroying the synovium that functions to produce synovial fluid. Synovial fluid is used for cartilage nourishment and lubrication of the joints. When the synovium is damaged, no synovial fluid is delivered. Hence, the friction at the joint is experienced, and the cartilage degrades and reduces in an amount resulting in arthritis. On the other hand, Osteoarthritis is the most prevalent type and it involves the normal wear and tear of the cartilage. It takes care of the joints. When it is worn out or reduced in size, the bones are destroyed as well as the joints. Psoriatic arthritis happens due to psoriasis that affects the skin over the joints, making the joints to be inflamed, stiff, and painful. Lupus erythematosus occurs when the immune system starts attacking every tissue in the body. An individual often experiences pain all over the body, including the joints. With regards to management, management of arthritis involves both psychological, 
medical, and physiotherapy aspects. Medication involves ibuprofen and paracetamol to relieve the pain. If the pain does not resolve, it is advisable that the patient seek surgical management and physiotherapy as an adjunctive measure to speed up the healing process. Physical therapy involves teaching the patient how to perform exercises on the affected joints, especially the range of motion exercises on the joints. Hot pads can also be applied to the painful joints, especially during the morning hours when there is still cold. The patient applies pad on the painful joint to relax the muscles, as well as improve blood circulation around the area. Management through surgery can be sought as the last option. It involves surgical repair, replacement, and fusion. That is the end of Part C. You now have two minutes to check your work.